Um, no, the things in the subway are never signed. Because you don't because want anybody looking Because the work, well, it. the drawing itself <laughs> is a signature. I mean, I most people can tell that the same person has done all the drawings. But if you don't sign it, how do they know who did it, and how do you get discovered? Um, well, most of the people in, in the subway probably still don't know who, who's doing them, mm -hmm. but, um, and that's probably the best way to come across them is to just see them and not know how they got there or why they got there. Um, but at the same time that I was doing things in the subways, I began showing things in galleries and um, things in the press and things. He stalks the New York City subways, waiting for his chance to strike. When the opportunity comes, he moves fast. He has to. Opportunity for Keith Haring is a blank advertising poster. Using a piece of chalk, the young man from Kutztown, Pennsylvania, draws a picture. A cartoon-like drawing, which he finishes in a minute or two, and then moves on. He may do as many as 30 such drawings in a day. All different, but all the same in certain ways. He puts them down here so that millions can see them, and millions do. You don't have to know anything about art to appreciate it. There aren't any hidden secrets or things that you're supposed to understand. But he's got to be careful, because technically what he's doing is illegal graffiti. I'm going to arrest for graffiti in the subway. Herring doesn't think he is defacing anything. He believes it is art, and many subway riders seem to agree. But the law is the law. For Herring, the arrest is always short-lived, and it's worth the temporary humiliation for him, because he wants ordinary people, subway riders, to see his stuff. Is it art? Well, upstairs, there doesn't seem to be any question about it. He's done murals like this one on the Bowery. And you'll often find Herring working on paintings that look for all the world like those subway drawings. This big one, for all its size, only took him a couple of hours to do. Here, too, he works fast. I, mean, I think it's more important to make a lot of different things and keep coming up with new images and things that were never made before than to do one thing and do it, do it well. They come out fast, but I mean, it's a fast world. And so fast has Keith Herring caught on in this fast world that now he has a one-man show at a gallery in Soho. Here are the same images, the cookie-cutter men, babies, hearts, dolphins, and spaceships. Only now, it is the art world looking on. They think it's art, all right. Beautiful. I can't get over it. Oh. Thank you. Herring has become a hot property. They ooh and they ah. I want to buy a few of these little Enough. wooden things. And they pay plenty. $15,000 for that two-hour special we saw him working on. Not bad for a 24-year-old kid from Kutztown. But even though he now gets fancy prices for a lot of his work, still, every chance he gets, it's back down into the subway system, looking furtively around to make sure the coast is clear, and then going to it. Art for the people. All for the price of a subway token. Birth, death, love, war. These simple, almost primitive images appeal to a wide range of people. The variety of people that were seeing the work brought with it a variety of responses and a variety of different ideas about what the work was. Paris, London, Brazil. By 1985, his work started to spring up around the world, crossing national and social boundaries. His work became a public voice for the young generation. Haring's work was simple and bold, instantly recognizable and easy to reproduce. Inevitably, the media caught on. In 1986, he opened a shop of his own. The pop shop opened in Lower Manhattan. A wide range of herring merchandise became available to shoppers of every kind. Yeah, I would like to get the bouncy thing with the black shirt. I like what he draws. I think it's cool. Some critics called it a sellout. The pop shop was more really a response to what was already happening in the world than it was something that was just an idea that was initiated on my part. 
I mean, the pop shop sort of grew naturally out of what the work was becoming anyway. The images had become part of the world. The, the, there's a lot of information that's really important to, to be passed on to people, and that if it's done in a way that's, that's interesting or is good quality, then it makes people even more interested in the thing that they're seeing or that they're learning. A lot of my quote-unquote introduction into the, the commercial side of things has been totally misunderstood and misrepresented by, um, by, especially by art critics or by sort of critics at large. I mean, people don't understand that there could possibly be any other motivation to do something that reaches a lot of people or to communicate on a, on a, on a, in a different way, in a new medium, in a new technique. Why would the dog be barking at the man at the Times Square station and worshipped as an idol at 14th Street? If there was a secret behind the subway drawings, it was semiotics, the theory of signs. At the School of Visual Arts, Herring studied semiotic theory and discovered that images can function like words. He uses images to create a language, like words in a sentence. The meaning of each symbol varies depending on how it is combined with other symbols. The drawings had become almost a vocabulary. There were flying saucers, there were pyramids, um, th things like this glowing rod that sort of was an archetypal, an archetypal weapon. I mean, it was anything from the, the sword and the stone to Darth Vader's um, you know, glowing rod. It sort of had this, this, this timeless, universal kind of thing where I was trying to, I think, use things that cut through all of, all of culture and all of history. Once I started to realize that exactly how I was communicating, I started to be much more aware of what I was communicating and, and really trying to sort of be more in touch with what exactly was going back and forth and not, not so much just putting out abstract thoughts, but really trying to guide people to see particular things and starting to to deal with more social concerns. A loner in the art world, but not to the rest of the world. Keith Haring, a stubborn optimist about life, about art, about people. If you love life, if you appreciate life and humans, then you should be against anything that's going against life and against people. I mean, when something is that obviously wrong, you have to be against it. You know, and, and I think it's partly responsibility, but it's partly just a natural response to, to seeing something that's wrong and wanting to, to say something about it or do something about it. The millions of people who go through the subway became the real world. So for him, this was his public. This, he felt that most of these people never went to see an exhibition. Many of them never went to the Museum of Modern Art or the Metropolitan Museum. So in a way, he felt this was the museum. He has a concept of art making and installation that uh, fits the culture. It's like it has a cultural place. Like when those early drawings were made in the subway, they were so important because you experience them graphically as the maker, but also the context of where they were in. And then of course, as his work developed, it became socially conscious.